The narratives of the future that involve body enhancement, communication, transportation, the myths, the lore, the stories throughout culture and throughout times have reminded us that we have lived in simulated environments. We have had artificial selves, aspects of ourselves duplicated in other formats rather than biological. For example, think back about the cave paintings and perhaps in a cave late at night as the firing flames of the flickering candle of the de documented images on the walls started telling a story to the early cave people about their capture, about the bison, about their accomplishing a vision, a passion that they awaited. And then we fast forward to our ancestors who had figurines, clay figures, stone figures, wooden figures that were idols and oftentimes duplications of themselves, alternative identities, not to mention hundreds of years later, the chemistry of filmmaking photographs, stories, narratives of some of the fears and joys of our lives preserved for decades, if not hundreds of years. And then, of course, there's virtuality, telepresence, which is on the cusp, gaming, second life, the metaverse, all these different environments for us to duplicate ourselves, aspects of ourselves across time. Well, we are certainly adaptive. There's no question about that. We're also multiple selves. And the more we think of ourselves as being multiple, the easier it is to understand the very aspects of ourselves that are captured, not only in our smartphones or in our avatars online in very 101 type of environments like Second Life, but imagine what they'll be like when they become more telepresence, more virtual, more 3D, when we can upload our brains into them and our minds become diverse, multiplicitous aspects of ourselves. So we're not just one agent any longer. We're multiple agents. So how do we tie this all in together? What is the vehicle that we could possibly use? We're flexible, yet we're vulnerable. We're fragile. And even if all the speakers that we've had so far have talked about their excellence and superb findings in science and technology dealing with the brain, robotics, prosthetics, we're still fragile. The only safety net we have today really to help extend our lives is chronic suspension. And that's still an if. However, based on the knowledge of the experts in the fields of science, technology, philosophy, ethics, design, psychology, engineering, it's transdisciplinary. You can't even mention all the fields that are part of this future. Thanks to that, there is a possibility that we could live longer unless and until genetic engineering comes around. And when that does, perhaps we can reverse aging. But what else? Do we want to remain inside these bodies? Probably not. We may want to look like we do today, perhaps. But we're vulnerable and we're fragile. And that's the truth. I started my work in the area of radical life extension back in the late 1970s. By the 1980s, I heard of a term called transhuman. I also read about evolution. I started thinking about what would it be like if we could live longer. I had a serious injury, I almost died, and that propelled me to thinking about the fragility of my body. I didn't know I was dying, yet I was found on the floor with a few minutes to live, and luckily someone found me, called an ambulance, and I survived. But how many of us know what's going on inside our bodies moment to moment? We don't communicate well enough with our body. And one of the greatest uh, fields that's emerging right now is in this digital wearable technology that is helping us understand what it's like to preserve aspects of our Self and to record aspects of ourselves. One of the leading groups in this is Quantified Self, thanks to Kevin Kelly and his colleagues. So we can start thinking about our numerical self, grasping aspects of ourselves and recording. But what do we really need to record? Our memory, our identity, who we are. In my work, I started looking at this early on, and then I started thinking, well, what could I do? So I wrote a manifesto. Um, Embarrassed to call it a manifesto. The word seems so silly, but I did. And I got on board the Cassini-Huggins spacecraft. 
and it went out to the far reaches of Saturn to study the, the rings of Saturn. And my words, we, were, we are indefinite. We will steer our own evolution or on board that spacecraft. That's inspired me to build a TV show. It was a cable TV show. It wasn't very large, but it was called Transcentury Update. And I hosted it and produced it in uh, Santa Monica, California for, I guess, just short of maybe eight years, I think it was. But it reached 100,000 people. And my show not only talked about space exploration, it talked about electric cars, life extension, artificial intelligence, the feasibility of nanotechnology, genetic engineering, all the ideas that I wanted to learn about. So I helped myself learn by interviewing people who were experts. And then I thought, what can I do about this? How can I bring it into my work as a designer, as a visual artist, a theoretician? What could I do? So I built um, a concept. And it was called Primo Posthuman. It was a future body prototype. And um, I thought it would probably be very wise to bring on a high-end scientific team. So I, I asked Arvin, Marvin Minsky of AI, uh, Eric Drexler of nanotechnology, Hans Morvik of robotics, uh, a number of others, and Max Moore of philosophy and ethics, identity. How could I build this future body prototype that would be a prosthetic, a whole body, uh, that could possibly be an alternative body for humans, uh, not only in physical material time, but also in virtual time? It would be a type of platform where you could connect. Where you could use it as a transportation device, but you could also use it to connect to other realities so that your identity could move from the physical material world into the virtual synthetic artificial world of cybernetics, uh, computerization, uh, new fields and new uh, substrates that we haven't even understood yet or developed yet. So that's what I was looking for, this type of platform that could be a uh, docking system. And I still remain at that point today. So I, in delineating this, I thought, well, first off, we need a platform diverse body. And I'm a designer, so I thought about how to design it. I built the prototype, but then I thought about where would this be? It must be in the biosphere in real time, materiality, physicality. It also needs to be in virtuality and cybernetic space. But the real issue is who are the users? Who are the people that would want this body? And as a designer, the fundamental principle is solving problems. To know who our users are, who our clients are, who are the people that need a problem to be solved, and then our work is to go about solving it. That's quite different than being an artist, where an artist creates ideas based on a, an impulse, an urge to experience and to share that experience with others. The designer is out to solve problems, to look for a need, a gap, and then to resolve it. I looked at it twofold. There were two objectives here. The first objective, to build a whole body prosthetic, theoretically, as a prototype thinking about what would be the science and technology of it, and then to consider the issues of self-awareness, thinking, actions, doing. How could that all be involved in it without uploading the mind? And certainly we have experts here speaking about that. But from my field, I think about the issues of the individual, what we want to experience. We hear a lot about the science and the technology. And we're told a lot, but there's no way we can really validate the um, possibility, the feasibility of it all. All we can do, if we're not experts in that area, is to imagine what we want for ourselves. Not to be told what we should have or what we ought to have, but to think about what our own directives are. What would make us feel like we've accomplished something? And what would be our roles within this? So then we get into the issue of marketability, to building the concept, looking at our user, testing it, readapting. It's called the iterative process of design, and considering how we'll bring this about to our user in the most fluid and easy way. So we think about the strengths, we think about the weaknesses, we think about the objectivity of it, we think about what could go wrong, and we rework it and rework and we work it until we get a prototype that's good enough to share. And then we take it to the user and we say, here it is, what do you think? And then we go back to the drawing board. So we need an action plan. And the first aspect of it is to understand what is needed, how long do we want to live? Well, many of us in this room want to live at least 100 years, 200 years. We also want to have alternative bodies, 
possibly, and many people do need alternative bodies. We look at how prosthetics has advanced so immeasurably over the past 10, 15 years with interesting robotics and AI driven. The designs are phenomenal. You can now design your own prosthetic, and your prosthetic can look like your Harley Davidson motorcycle, or it can look like the tattoo on your arms. So it's becoming very immersive and very design wise, and it's a whole new field for designers. So in building a design brief, the iterative process is to sketch it out, rethink it, take it back to the drawing board, rework it again, and to interview experts, find out what they're doing, and then take it back to the, the studio, the design table, etc. Now, one thing I've noticed and this is a very clear observation on my part, is that the design field is often not included in the staunch arguments and debates and discussions about what the future is going to be like. It's this big gap. We hear a lot about accelerating change and uh, exponential growth as far as technology is concerned. But technology, even though it's the tool that we've been uh, using since our first days with the stone or the bow and arrow. It's been a tool that we've always used to enhance ourselves. So human enhancement is historical. However, we need to get away from this idea that we're driven by technology without the idea that we are in the driver's seat. Therefore, I have to pay tribute to some of my um, favorite uh, influencers uh, over the past 30 years, Norbert Weiner in cybernetics especially going into second order cybernetics where we are part of the, the observation, we are leading the way, we're included within the system. Buckminster Fuller, the designer who thought about the Earth as a spaceship going through space and solving problems on the global scale. Lynn Margulies, a scientist who actually is the evolutionary biologist who thought about where we do come from and what we are, and ask the question, what is life? And if we're here at 2045, thinking about the future, thinking about mind uploading, thinking about prosthetic bodies and full body avatars, we need to think about what is life? What is this aspect of ourselves that we want to preserve? What are we holding on to? Who are we? And this question has yet to be answered. We still don't understand consciousness. And we can go back to Aristotle, all the great thinkers over time. We can move forward to Max Moore and Andrew Sandberg and Martin Rothblatt, uh, the former speakers who I absolutely adore their thinking. And they're so crystalline in identifying the issue of ethics identity, multiplicity, diversity, and finding out about yourself what it is you need, where you're going, and what you hope to achieve. So we are not only the brain, we're the mind, we're the body, we're these components together. We can't just have an upload without a body. This whole idea, this postmodernist idea that we are this disembodied brain if we want to be an upload is absolutely absurd. There's no way we could possibly be just a mind rotating in space. Whether it's a set of algorithms neatly packaged, that package is still a body. So that means we have to redefine the body. The body that we have today is a biological transportation unit that contains our central nervous system, that communicates with our brain, that is our sensorial mix, that is our love machine, our rhythm to dancing to music, our athletic usability. This body that we have can be something other that will sustain us over time, in which case we'd need nanomedicine, we'd need genetic engineering, we'd need Aubrey de Grey's SENS project, we'd need out Max Moore's cryonics, we would need Martine Rothblatt's mind file, we would need all the work that makes us a component, that keeps us as an identity continuous over time. Otherwise, we're just a, a brain in a vat. That's not what we want. So this is my original design just as a backlash. This is in 1996, I think I designed this, again with the team I mentioned earlier, um, experts who knew a heck of a lot more than I did. I was a designer um, and filmmaker, uh, videographer, just hoping that I could get into this world that I could somehow express myself having gone through um, some physical issues and always having this joie de vivre, this love of life and, and understanding why life is so short. It just simply didn't make sense to me from the get-go. Never has, still doesn't. So I designed this body and I took it um, in early 2000 to the next stage where I got into quantified self before quantified self actually. It was a group called Kronos in Scottsdale, Arizona. And it was in the late 1990s I had my body checked, my bone scan, bone density, muscle mass, my heart rate, my physicality, 
I didn't have it enough because it didn't catch my cancer, but what I did was I looked at my spine and degeneration, and I thought about what type of body could appeal to these areas that weren't being talked about. Certainly the Minsky's, the um, uh, Drexler's, the Moravex, we're thinking far future. That's great, but what about the here and now? What can we do today to prolong our bodies and our minds, our cognition, who we are as people, mind, brain, body, perception, cognition, emotion, love, empathy. These are the words that we need to remember when we're talking about backing up the brain and living in cyberspace. So I created a brain system that includes a social ecology, a body system, systematic care, engineered style, and behavior. And part of this is you can turn it in like you can do a used car, but the warranty requires that you take care of it. And if you don't take care of it, you don't get a new one. So if we start looking at beautiful designs of how robotics and prosthetics can become seamless and sexy and sensual with the body, we start looking at new ways of thinking about design. And robotics, of course, is very sexy concept. And we took a look today at a prosthetic hand that was so beautiful to touch. And if you haven't had that handshake yet, by all means, get it, because it feels really good. He can't feel it, unfortunately, yet, but that haptic system is right around the corner, so robotics will have touch. But so how does that affect the whole body uh, prosthetic, the avatar body, in a number of ways? So we have this adaptive body design, which needs to exist in linear time, which is the biosphere, and in nonlinear time, which is cyberspace, virtuality, gaming, the metaverse, computational systems. And then we need to think more carefully about what it is we want to become. Why would we want to live longer? What we, can we contribute to society? How can we use this time right now to be part of this movement, to be part of the connective society of people who want to advance themselves? How does our body, our mind work with our brain through the computer, through all the technologies that we have today that are showing us deep inside our body and hopefully further inside our brain to understand the neural networks. It all comes back to human enhancement and it leans toward radical life extension and us discerning for ourselves how we can be part of it. My next project is to build the framework for an academic course, hopefully on the graduate level, in human enhancement that seeks radical life extension. It would certainly employ the work already done with human computer interfaces, wearable technology, BCI, any type of human body interaction, immersivity, and it also includes installation art. The gaming aspect of looking towards going into an environment where you can experience it, so that brings together the, all the elements of experiential design. So, Rather than talking about living longer, what would it be like to go, us to go into an installation that's beautifully designed, that gives us a taste and experience of going into this world that we're talking about? That's what we need, and that's what I hope to build at university level. And I welcome you all to join me in this and contact me, please. Uh, you can get my uh, information in the program or certainly call um, GF2045 and ask them. But I think we need this course, not just theoretically, but practice based. Currently in design, it's very involved in human computer interaction, but a very basic wearable technology level, uh, building apps for smartphones. We need to take it to the next level. I can't do this alone. I need your help. I think there's an opportunity. I think there's a gap, and I think we can do it. Thank you very much.